we at the PPC are not pro-Russia, we are not pro-Putin, and you said it very right, he is a, a, you know, a, a dictator, and, but we must understand also uh, the situation, and we must know our history. After the Cold War in the 1990s, we created a NATO, that was the organization to defend uh, Western countries and America. And we said to the Russia at that time, to them, you know, we won't expand NATO near your borders. We won't do that. And NATO expansion was a tragic mistake that we did in the past. So what is happening right now is, you know, we pump the Ukraine to be on our side, West being with us, and the UN asked Ukraine to come and to be part of the uh, economic union, and uh, not the UN, the economic union, the EU. And so, and so there's, and there, there was a lot of pressure also uh, for us Western countries to accept Ukraine part of NATO. And, and, we have to answer that request and to say to everybody and to Russia that it would be a no. But Hello, Danielle. How are you doing today, Max? Yes, great. What a week. Oh, my God. There's a lot of uh, news in the, that we can discuss today, but um, I'm very pleased that you focus on these uh, three topics that are important for the future of our country. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's dive right in, Max. I, I want to kick things off with a, with a focus on ongoing COVID restrictions here in Canada. While many people are kind of focused on what's going on abroad, there's still so many important battles to fight for freedom here in Canada. We've seen a lot of positive changes just over the last few weeks, uh, starting in Saskatchewan, who led the charge for, for freedom a couple of weeks ago, uh, spurred on by the Freedom Convoy. We've also seen many provinces follow suit. Uh, Quebec uh, tabled a, a plan to, to have most restrictions repealed by, by mid-March. And earlier this week in, in Alberta, they, they have repealed uh, as much as all the restrictions, as far as I understand. Uh, and, and in Ontario, similarly, uh, they have repealed capacity limits as well as the VAX pass. Uh, and even Doug Ford earlier this week uh, alluded to, to mask mandates also being pulled. What do you think of uh, these moves by our provincial governments? And, and what do you think caused such a sudden change? Yes, Daniel. So first of all, I believe that we must uh, thank our freedom fighters and we must thank also the truckers and all these people that were out there fighting to regain our freedoms in the beginning of that, that pandemic. And, you know, now, because like I said, we were maybe a minority of people that were asking for ending these uh, mandates. And now that minority is growing and these establishment politicians are doing politics based on polling and focus groups. So now more people are fed up with that and they understand that all these uh, restrictions are not based on science anymore, if it was in the beginning, but now they are not. And we just learned in Quebec actually when the premier of Quebec at last December, before Christmas, decided to impose a curfew. Uh, they were looking for a justification for that. And uh, he was asking the uh, health department to try to have a study that will say, yeah, doing a, you know, a curfew and, uh, and more lockdowns, it is helping to stop the spread of the virus. But they were not able to find any study. We just learned that today. So it was not based on science. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was based on political science <laughs> and focus groups. So, so now people understand that the logic is on our side, the common sense, and 
there's no reason to have these mandates. And like I said before, we need to learn to live with that virus and stop living in fear. And now traditional establishment politicians are saying that. So that's a good news. But the bad news, Danielle, is that, you know, Trudeau in Ottawa does not understand that, you know, the virus is, is not dangerous anymore or where, where, where is that virus right now, you know? So we still have <laughs> draconian restrictions uh, for Canadian tra travelers, so I cannot travel by plane or by train, and we still have a vaccine passport and mandate at the federal level. So that must end. That's why I'm saying to Canadians, you know, we must uh, do the fight. We must speak to our friends and our families, and uh, and we must ask to end all these mandates at the federal and provincial level as soon as possible. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a great point. We've seen a lot of provincial governments taking action the last uh, few weeks, but relative silence from the from the federal government. Um, yeah. There's still lots of federal restrictions in place. Uh, one of the most notable is uh, the the bans on travel, uh, ferries, uh, rail travel, as well as air travel. Um, a few weeks ago, you've you've partnered with the the JCCF, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, to to launch a lawsuit against these restrictions. Uh, can you tell our viewers a bit more about that uh, lawsuit? Yes, we launched that, and first of all, I must thank the just thank the Justice Center for that, uh, and they're helping me because my constitutional rights is violated with that uh, vaccine passport and that restriction on me and on all Canadians that decided not to have the two shots. And so what it, what will happen in a couple of weeks, that will be the first hearing. And I hope we will have a decision early 2023 or maybe before the end of this year. So, and uh, I believe that I'll be able to win that, uh, that lawsuit. Uh, it's uh, because now COVID-19 is behind us and there's no reason, like I said. So, and I hope that uh, Trudeau will act before, um, <clears throat> before I have a final decision from the court. But uh, we need to have that final decision uh, that will be uh, in favor of us because we don't want that to start again in two, three or four years. And that would be important to stay vigilant because when the flu season will come back in November, December, we don't want these uh, governments to do the same thing that they did in 2021. So uh, we will uh, always be there and, and fight. And um, right now, I believe that we'll be able to enjoy our freedom, I hope, before the summer. I hope that I'll be able to travel also. But Daniel, I just want to see to say that uh, if I'm not able personally to travel by plane uh, <clears throat> in May, my goal is to travel by car and doing a tour a tour in uh, Atlantic Canada, and so building the party over there, seeing our people over there, doing rallies over there, speaking to our people, helping to build the party in Atlantic Canada. That's my plan for this May, but I hope I'll be able to do that traveling by plane if not i'll travel by car that's an exciting announcement so maxim out out in uh, atlantic canada in may look forward to it get it in your calendars um the, the last thing i want to touch on uh in regards to the the covid situation is just uh uh, connected to the Freedom Convoy, uh, we this week we saw a, a secondary hearing for for Tamara Litch, who's been uh, who's remained in jail uh, in the wake of the the Freedom Convoy protest, um, and then even we saw some pretty unbelievable uh, measures taken for her. Uh, it was it was tweeted out that she was in shackles, not only not only handcuffed, but her feet were shackled as if she's a, some sort of threat to the to the court proceedings. What, what, what do you think about the, the developments around Tamara Litch? Well, first of all, you know, uh, when she was arrested, I tweeted that uh, she was, uh, uh, that was uh, not based on anything, just uh, she was a political opponent of Justin Trudeau. And, and sh she's a political prisoner right now. She, she's in, in jail because of 
what not because of what she did, because of what she, what she believed in, and, and so it's it's you cannot have that in a democratic country where you have the rule of law. And if I remember, she was not alone in the organization of that protest. And another uh, leader is out and, you know, is free outside uh, waiting for his uh, hearing. And she's still in jail with no reason. And they are, <clears throat> they are looking at her like she's a big criminal and she's not. She's a mom that decided to do something for country and now she's in jail and and i hope i hope that everybody will remember that what the government can do to you and to your freedom if that is happening to her it can happen to another person also being in jail for nothing i was in jail personally for 12 hours after a gathering in a park in manitoba without any reason and and so it's uh you know it's very sad and uh, i hope uh, she's supposed to have another earring soon and i hope that she'll be able to go back home uh, and have a dinner with her family and her kids and, and husband and uh, she will be back for she won't leave the country she will be back for her earring for sure uh, it's uh, you know it's a big discrimination and the, what they're doing to her. And there's no reason why she must be, there's no reason why she must be in jail right now. No reason. Yeah, no, it's it's absurd. It's shameful uh, to watch uh, our own leadership uh, lecture other countries about freedom and democracy while, yeah. while harboring political prisoners in our own country. Yeah. Um, before we shift gears uh, over to the economy, I, I do want to remind everyone to, to like, share, subscribe uh, on whatever platform you might be watching on right now uh, as well. Uh, don't don't forget to check out our website and sign up for our newsletter to, to keep informed on what's going on with the, the PPC. Um, I do want to transition over to the, the economy now, uh, Maxim. Uh, as we start moving out of this uh, COVID era, as we see restrictions uh, be repealed across the country, I think we can both agree that the focus will start to shift back to, to the economic situation, uh, which is not the best as a result of these restrictions. Um, inflation is running rampant, uh, and the impacts are, are really being felt by average Canadian citizens. Earlier this week, the, the central bank, the Bank of Canada, increased the key <coughs> interest rate by 0.25% to 0.5%. Can you explain to our viewers why the bank did this and, and what impacts this change might have? But what the, <clears throat> the governor of the bank said, it is to control inflation, but it won't happen. You know, when you have inflation in our country, that is at 5.1%, and that's the official inflation rate. The real one, I believe, must be more than that, maybe six, seven, eight percent. Just look in the US. In the US, their inflation rate is seven percent. But the real one, about 15 percent. Why? Because if you take the formula that they were using 30 years ago to calculate inflation, you'll have 15 percent inflation in US instead of seven percent because governments don't like inflation and they don't want you to know the real cost of living. So that's why they changed the formula. And so in Canada, that's the same thing. We don't have the same formula that we had 30 years ago. So now they, they change the formula to have a lower inflation rate. So the official one is 5.7%. But we know if you do your grocery, if you go to put some gas in your car, you'll see that the inflation may be higher than 5.1%, and I believe it is. So when you said that you will control inflation by increasing the interest rate from zero, from 0.25 to 0.50, you know, when the inflation is 5.1, th that will have no impact on inflation. That's why the Bank of Canada said, we will increase our interest rate on a regular basis and in, in coming months. But, you know, if you want to control the inflation, you need to increase your interest rate by, you know, 3%, 4% when the inflation is at 5.1.
So first of all, that won't have any impact on the inflation. And second, <laughs> the inflation will go higher because of that uh, war in Ukraine and the impact of that war, we will pay for it because of gas and, and, and natural resources, uh, resources and all that, that the price with that will go up. So the inflation at 5.1 will go up. And the Bank of Canada cannot <clears throat> increase the inflation rate too high to control the inflation, because if they're doing that, a lot of people will go bankrupt. You know, we are in huge debt, private debt and public debt. And so when you rise, when you are raising interest rate, it will hurt the economy. So corporations have huge debt, individual Canadians have huge debt and governments have huge debt. So if you do that, imagine the interest that the government of Canada and every province will have to pay for the interest on their debt so that will kill the economy. So they cannot be serious to kill the inflation. And actually, that's the only way to control these debts by, by, by the inflation. Like, like we had in the 1950s, we had inflation during that decade to pay for the uh, Second World War. Now we are paying and we'll have inflation for couple of years in Canada to pay for the COVID hysteria, all these deficits and all these debt. And the Bank of Canada, first of all, it must not be the role of a bank, of a civil servant in Ottawa, bureaucrats in Ottawa, to fix the interest rate. It must be fixed by the market, a free market. Now you have bureaucrats in Ottawa that are telling and they know better than you what must be the interest rate. You know, you don't have bureaucrats that are fixing the price for bread or the price for, for food. No, it's the free market. It must be the same time with the money, but it, it is, but it, the same thing, sorry, for the money, but it is not the same thing. So <clears throat> that's why our solution for that, for not having any, uh, any inflation, we need to give to the Bank of Canada an inflation target of 0%. 20% interest rate is bad. 20% inflation, sorry, is bad. 5% is bad. 2% is bad. But with a zero target inflation rate, you will keep your purchasing power. Because now with that, the, the fact that the Bank of Canada raised the interest, the interest rate by 25 points, that means that people who had a mortgage uh, uh, and they will, the cost of their mortgage will go up. People who have debts on their credit cards, they will, pay, they will pay higher for that. If you didn't fix your interest rate for your home, for your mortgage, you will have to pay more for, the, for, for your mortgage because of, that, of the fact that the Bank of Canada raised that uh, interest rate from 25 points. So the real policy, we must balance the budget and lower taxes to every Canadians. And so also consumer tax, because, <clears throat> and if you balance the budget and you do that, you'll give more money in Canadians pockets. And you must have an agreement at the same time with the bank to be sure that the purchasing power of our dollar will stay the same with a zero inflation target. And now that's not the case. We are poor, everybody is poor, and I believe that it's only the beginning. Yeah, 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 it's the socialist era that you're always explaining. Yeah. Uh, now, as well, uh, another measure to combat this is uh, back in December of last year, we saw Bill S. 233 get introduced uh, an act to develop a national framework for a guaranteed livable income uh, it passed first reading in the house of commons and it's currently in the senate for second reading what do you think about a uh, basic income and do you think it's an effective means of addressing uh or helping canadians cope with increasing inflation first we are broke you know, where are we going to take the money? The Bank of Canada will print more money for that and you'll have more inflation because, like I said, 
the 5.1% inflation is a tax. It is a hidden tax, one of the worst of all taxes, because instead of the government to take your own money in your own pocket, saying I'm taxing you, I'm taking your money, and that will go to the government. The government is telling you, keep your money in your pocket, but you won't be able to buy the same amount of goods and services with that money because of the inflation. So you are poor. Your purchasing power is going down. Your standard of living is going down. That's why the 5.1% inflation is a tax, a 5.1% tax on all Canadians. So the, 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 the universal income for everybody, if you want to do that, if you're serious about doing that, you must cut all the other programs from the federal government and provincial government to have only one program, program that would be that universal income from everybody. So we are in a federation. The federal government does not control programs at the provincial level. So you, it's very difficult to implement a program like that at the federal level. So if you want to help people because the inflation is there, is to lower their taxes first. You know, if you go and, and put some gas in your car, there's a third of the price is taxes. So if the government is serious, it can lower taxes and, and being sure that people will pay less for their gas. But if they do that, they have to cut other spending. And we have a proposal for that. You, you have to cut, you know, CBC, you can save a billion dollars, corporate welfare, you can save about five billion dollars, foreign aid. We have a program to be sure that will balance the budget and after that, uh, uh, cutting taxes and, uh, and uh, to taxes and income tax that Canadians are paying. So there's other solution. So I believe that this bill, it's another socialist, socialist bill that won't do anything for Canadians. And, you know, it's, uh, I don't believe it will pass. I don't wish and must not pass. We must be fiscally responsible. And with that bill, we are not. That will create more inflation instead of uh, fixing the problem. Yeah, it's it's absolutely absurd. Flooding the money supply with more printed fiat is is an absolutely backwards way of addressing <laughs> yeah. inflation. It seems like another vote buying scheme to me. Yeah, it is. Uh, before we shift gears into our final and main topic for this evening, uh, I do want to again remind people to to like, share, subscribe, uh, check out our website, check out our platform. There's a lot of great details on there uh, to back up everything that Maxim has been saying. <coughs> um, but with that, let's let's dive into our, our last topic, which will be the kind of ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Uh, before we get into that, I do want to remind everyone that we'll close out this evening with a with an open question period. We'll be taking questions in uh, the chats on all of our platforms. Uh, so if you do have a question, uh, save it right there for the end. We'll 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 do a good 10, 15 minutes of open questions. Um, but with that out of the way, uh, let's close the show out with a, a bit of a chat on the ongoing situation in, in Ukraine. Uh, there have been many developments since we, we last discussed this uh, a week ago, and we have received a, a lot more questions about the, our position on on Ukraine, given that it's uh, so different from the mainstream narrative. Uh, I've seen over the last couple of weeks, uh, the, the conversation around this, uh, this conflict has gotten incredibly narrow. Uh, it seems to be either you're absolutely for Ukraine or you support a murder, murderous uh, imperialist dictator, and there's no in-between, uh, which is pretty absurd because uh, it is a very nuanced and, and complicated situation. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you can uh, explain to our viewers uh, how we got into this geopolitical mess uh, and what the, the West might have been able to do to avoid it. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And we need to know our history before uh, answering that question. Yeah. And, and you're right. Before, I just want to say that we don't support Putin. We at the PPC are not pro-Russia. We are not pro-Putin. And you said it very right. He is a, a, you know, a, a dictator. And, but we must understand also uh, the situation. And we must know our history. After the Cold War, 
in the 1990s, we created uh, NATO. That was the organization to defend uh, Western countries and America. And we said to the Russia at that time, to them, you know, we won't expand NATO near your borders. We won't do that. And NATO expansion was a tragic mistake that we did in the past. So what is happening right now is, you know, we pump the Ukraine to be on our side, West being with us, and the UN asked Ukraine to come and to be part of the uh, economic union, and uh, not the UN, the economic union, the EU. And so, and so there's, and there, there was a lot of pressure also uh, for us Western countries to accept Ukraine part of NATO. And, and we have to answer that request and to say to everybody and to Russia that it would be a no. But we Western countries doesn't want to deal with that. And actually, the, uh, the invasion by Russia was absolutely wrong to attack a sovereign country. I want to be clear about that. I'm not supporting that. But I understand that put you in the same situation in the West. If you have Russia or if you have China that are you know, putting some missile in Mexico or in Canada, what do you think will be the answer from the US? They won't like it. And actually we had the answer passed in the history when uh, Kennedy and Russia tried to put some missile in Cuba. Kennedy said, I cannot tolerate, you know, having communist country at my doors. So they did a blockade and that, you know, that the, the, the solution was an agreement and Russia decided not to put his, uh, uh, their, their missiles in Cuba. So, but now we want Ukraine to be part of NATO. That's the same thing. And I can understand the frustration by Russia and Putin about that. And don't forget also the history. Ukraine, uh, centuries ago, were part of uh, uh, Russia. And you need to know the history. And in Ukraine, you know, you don't have, you have people who are speaking uh, Russian and Ukrainian. And so there's different ethnicity in the country. And now we, with that war, and we have some people that are asking that Canada must be part of that. And actually we must put more pressure on Russia. So what we are doing, we are not, we are not participating, participating actively in that war. And I said, our position must not, we must not have to be part of that conflict. It is not our conflict. And I understand that it's wrong by, by Putin to invade Ukraine, but we must have a diplomatic solution of that. But instead of that, the West is putting more pressure on Putin with, Putin, put, <laughs> with Russia uh, with more you know, economic um, uh, pressure. And I call that the economic war. And that will have another impact also in Canada with all these uh, restrictions that we are imposing on Russia. Yeah, yeah. Before we get into the the economic war, uh, I, I want to stay on the on the kind of hot war. Um, in recent, uh, just this week, I, I believe uh, we've had uh, even prominent Canadians like former uh, retired General Rick Hillier calling for things like a, a NATO imposed. Uh, no fly zone. Uh, I actually want to uh, play a clip that we we have. They need a no fly zone over the Ukraine to allow them to operate, to defend their own country, and to be able to actually stand up to Putin and in negotiations say, "Hey, we'll accept the unconditional surrender of all the Russian soldiers in the Ukraine, and now how can we get along in the future here?" They can last inside of those built-up areas, but it is going to be brutal, and and they can't last unless we give them better. Uh, defensive support, better better weapons, better more ammunition and better ammunition and the kind of things that they need. NATO ran a war in Afghanistan. NATO tried to conduct operations in Afghanistan in August, did not do so well at that one. 
but you start your defense earlier than that. That no-fly zone, I posted about it, you know, a week ago. We should have been doing it. Putin might have had second sort of thoughts before he launched if we had done it. So that's former uh, Canadian General Rick Hillier <coughs> calling for NATO to impose a no-fly zone over, over the Ukraine. Uh, what do you think of such a measure from, from the North American uh, or the Western Alliance? Yeah, but before answering your question, Daniel, he spoke about Afghanistan. I was foreign affairs minister at that time under the upper government. Afghanistan was a big mistake for Western countries. You know, after 15 years, what you have, you have the Taliban that are controlling Afghanistan. And so, and the U.S. are not there. That was not a winning war for us in Afghanistan. And he was part of that war. So, you know, you need to have... Uh, diplomats and politicians that understand history. If you do that, if you impose a no-fly zone, that's a red line that we must not cross. When I'm saying we, uh, Western countries, we must not cross because that will mean that we are in war with uh, Russia and we are in that war. So we must not cross that. I said, we must not be part of that as a country, Canada and Western countries. The solution, is to, the solution is to understand the security interest of Russia, that they don't want to have a NATO country at its doors. And also, uh, Russia must understand that Ukraine, Ukraine sorry, must stay a sovereign country. So that's, and you must have these discussion. So, what he's asking is asking for a full war, but you don't know where all that will end. It's easy to start a war, but it's, it's tough to know where all that will end. Look, Afghanistan, we lost lives, Canadian soldiers, and we were telling them, you go there to defend freedom, to free a country. And what is happening right now? They die for nothing because that country, the Taliban, are controlling that country. We don't want that. There's, you know, Canada was not part of the war in Iraq. Chrétien took the right decision. And now you have all these uh, so-called that want Canada to be in war with uh, Russia. Our enemies is China. Russia, you know, we, we need to have an understanding of what they want, but they need to understand also that Ukraine must stay a sovereign country. So you cannot invade a sovereign country. And I believe that the solution will be with discussion and not, not putting more oil on the fires like that colonel want us to do. Yeah, it's absurd. Uh, the first thing that happens if you impose a no-fly zone over the Ukraine is Russia flies a jet through Ukraine. Like, uh, it's not going to solve anything. Uh, but we have seen Western countries uh, impose all sorts of economic sanctions over the last couple of weeks. Uh, most notably, earlier this week, uh, Russia was removed from the SWIFT banking system, uh, a system that helps coordinate uh, banks from across the globe. Uh, wh what do you think uh, of this move and, and what are some potential implications of it? Yeah, <clears throat> there's huge implication on it. And maybe some people don't realize that. Huge implication. Because now that system is the system that uh, banks are using to do their transaction between them. And so if you cut Russia for that, you're saying to Russia, we don't want you to be part of the uh, monetary system. And that is, the, the, that is dominated by the U.S. dollar. So we are pushing Russia to the arms of China, and that's what they're doing. So, you know, that will, will have a huge impact for also Russian people, uh, and that will have an impact also on us, Canada, because the price of uh, gas and the price of other natural resources that uh, uh, Russia is, is uh, selling to the West will go up. And, and you know, if you want to change the... <clears throat> monetary order and the fact that the fiat um, US dollars is the dollar and the monetary unit for international transaction, 
Yes, I'm for I'm for that. I'm for uh, I'm against the fiat uh, money. I'm for a money that will be based on something based on gold, the gold standard. We had that in the 19th century and uh, that was working. So we must have that because like that government cannot create money out of thin air like they're doing not only Canada, but uh, the Europe, uh, Germany, France and the uh, UK and and us so that's why we have inflation not only in canada and us and in other countries so that the impact of that will be a change and maybe uh, uh, russia will go with china to try to change that monetary order that we have right now and and i know that because the russian central bank and chinese central bank are buying a lot of gold and they did that not yesterday, a couple of years ago. And they want to diversify their portfolio that they have. Usually a central bank will have in a portfolio other currencies like the American dollar and gold. So what they want to do, they want to have fewer fiat other currencies and more gold. So when we'll have a discussion about a new standard, a new monetary unit based on something, it will be based on gold and they will have gold. So I don't want, I want these changes happen by negotiation, not a crisis accelerating these changes. And actually, as you know, the Bank of Canada didn't have any gold. They didn't have any gold. So we are one of the few countries, central bank countries that didn't have gold backing their dollar. So that will have an impact also on, on us. So we, we are pushing these uh, uh, transformation and without having time to have some negotiation and taking the time and the impact. And uh, I know it, it's, a very, it's a very bad move. We need to go to the table and have a discussion with Russian, being sure that we are promoting the sovereignty of Ukraine and at the same time understanding that Russia doesn't want any missiles, any, any country that is at their doors being part of the West. And we, we must understand that. Actually, they tried to do that to us, to the US, with the, with the Cuba uh, missiles crisis in the 1960s. And the Americans said no. So it must be easy to understand. But now we have, you know, it's this week, that war is worse than it was last week and we are escalating all that so that's why i'm and i don't know but uh, reason and, and discussion must prevail i hope it will yeah, yeah yeah people there's such an oversimplified view of this whole situation it's just war is bad russia's the bad guy and we must sanction them people don't understand that we're in a uh, we're in an age of flux we're moving from this kind of unipolar power system where we have a, a single hegemonic power in the, um, the us to a more multipolar system where there's multiple great powers uh especially the emerging kind of authoritarian powers of, of russia and and china um and, and pushes like this like this move to to push them out of swift um can have serious implications uh uh, these countries are preparing for for movements into the different monetary systems. There's there's rumors of a of a crypt uh, Chinese launched cryptocurrency backed by gold. Um, what what kind of uh, impacts would that have on Canada if if we moved away from the from the the American dollar as a as a reserve currency? But if we do it, if we do it slowly with an agreement and having time to to do the transition the impact will be less severe. But if we do that because of a crisis and, and that, that is happening, it can be very uh, dramatic for, for Canadians because, like I said, the Bank of Canada does not own any gold. And if we have the money that is an international monetary system that is based on gold, it, it will be very difficult for Canadians. So what I'm saying is our standard of living may may go down a little bit and our purchasing power will be hurt also so add that 
with the inflation that we have, with huge deficit that we have at the federal and provincial level, with the debts that people have and, and corporations, it's um, we have all the ingredients for a perfect storm. And it won't happen tomorrow, but it can happen in that decade. And so that's why I believe that we must change that. And I think we can in Canada, uh, promoting the right policies at, at the federal level, but also internationally, uh, they must have the discussion to be sure that, you know, we don't want we don't want to to be in a in a position where for tomorrow the U.S. dollar won't be the dominant uh, dollar that we use in international transaction. Because if we do that uh, rapidly, the impact would be very very bad on our standard of living. If we do that gradually with negotiation, and and uh, it would be less. Uh, so, but. That, that system of fiat money will have to end a day or another. It's always, you know, it can take 100 years, but it's always end uh, by inflation. And the inflation, look what happened in Germany uh, after the first world war. You know, they had inflation and, and, and they were not able to control the inflation because of the spending from the government and all that. And people were poor poor and the purchasing power was going down the standard of living was going down i don't want that to happen in other countries like it happened in germany after the first world uh, war yeah yeah well said uh, i i hope it's clear to people that uh this situation is a is a lot more complicated than uh what's being talked about in the mainstream it's certainly not a black and white issue uh that's just ukraine good russia bad it's a it's a very complicated situation and, and the results could have uh even more serious implications in the long term uh at that at this point i, I do want to open up the floor uh to, to questions uh from our audience uh it doesn't have to be on the the topics we discussed today although it can be um we're open to, to any sort of questions um so start rolling them in um and if you have any uh loaded uh, we, we can get some on the screen here we go. We have Dean Me uh, Dan Meachin from uh, YouTube asks, Max, can we work towards fuel independence? But first of all, I think if we want to work uh, towards that, we must uh, have pipelines in, in this country. You know, we have a lot of natural resources, a lot of gas, uh, but, you know, we need to be able to export that. And the only way is to have pipelines. And we are for pipelines. And, you know, we're in 2022. We are able to build pipelines uh, uh, safe, uh, that would be safe for the population and safe for the environment in 2022. So if you do that, you'll be able to sell that to other markets, you'll, you'll become richer and you'll be more independent. Uh, yes, but actually as a country, we are not in a situation like other countries. In Quebec, we have a lot of hydroelectricity and there's the nuclear, nuclear power also that it's, you know, we, we can use that, but um, uh, yeah, we must, we must be able to uh, have more pipelines, sell our, our natural resources to other markets and, and, and maybe promote the de development of uh, nuclear energy. Excellent. Uh, we have a question from Chantel Boy Stewart on Facebook. Hey, Maxim. What are your thoughts on the federal digital ID? I'm saying no to that. I don't want that. Uh, you know, it's it will be another tool that the government will be able to use in the future to control you. So we are against that. We'll do everything to be sure that it won't happen in this country. Excellent. We have a question from Alex Lozano on YouTube. Being punished for thought crimes or wrong think is not the bedrock of a free democratic society. I don't think that's a question, but I yeah. agree with it. Yeah, I agree also. Uh, absolutely. Um, that's, uh, that, that, that's what happened to me. When I was arrested in Manitoba, the police asked me, do you have any weapons? I said, no, only my words 
only my philosophy. And, and yes, that, you know, they arrested me because they didn't like what I was saying. That was political repression. That is happening in Canada in 2022. Yeah. Uh, and we have one from Conserve Canada on YouTube. Will PPC work on keeping firearms for legal citizens uh, and remove the, the order in council? Yes. The answer is yes. Very short. We'll do that for sure. We, yeah. oh. you know, you have the right. If you follow the regulations, if you have all the courses and everything, and you put your gun in a safe place and these regulations that uh, you have to respect, you have the right to have a gun. And uh, yes, we will remove that. Yeah, yeah. Guns shouldn't be classified by how scary they look. The, that's for yeah. sure. Uh, Yvonne Boudarj uh, from YouTube says, Max, would you scrap the carbon tax? Yeah, I said that. It's part of our program. We won't have any carbon tax at the federal level. The good news is that the environment is a shared jurisdiction with provinces. So if some province want to who, who wants to impose a, a, a carbon tax they, they they will be able to do that but us at the federal level we won't play that game we won't impose any carbon tax yeah and the modern carbon tax is admittedly uh ineffective uh they, they even the government itself has admitted that it has to be at a much much higher rate to to effectively reduce our, our carbon emissions to their arbitrary targets yeah uh, if you want to change the behavior of canadians uh yes if you tax it can but the higher the tax is the better it is to change the behavior but trudeau didn't have the courage to put a carbon tax that would be very high knowing that it won't be popular because you need that to be sure if you want to push people to not buy gas anymore because it's too expensive and that's why you know we we don't we know that the climate is changing but we don't believe that the solution is a carbon tax actually the solution will be at the provincial level for climate change we won't sign the paris accord we won't do anything about that We'll let provinces deal with it if they want to deal with it. Yeah, exactly. The The current carbon tax is nothing more than virtue signaling. Yeah. Paul on YouTube asks, Bill C-11, where do we stand? That's a, I believe that's the rebranded uh, internet censorship bill. It used to be C-10. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I said during the last campaign, we'll repeal that. We're against that. We, we, we are fighting for freedom of speech, freedom of assembly for our charter of rights. And, you know, we don't have, want the government to tell us what to do. And we want, don't want the government to manage what we are doing on the social media. So uh, we're saying no to that. Yeah, exactly. Who's, who's to say the, the government wouldn't have issue with, uh, with uh, our social media content right now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fia Fernandez on on. YouTube asks, Mr. Bernier, how would you bring together Canadians from all walks of life to understand that our rights, freedoms, and financial futures are at risk? Can it be done, in your opinion? I think more people understand that after COVID-19 and that COVID hysteria, uh, you know, it would be very hard for another government to impose draconian measures like they did during COVID-19. Because I believe that people now understand that the, the government what the government was doing was not based on based on science uh, and it was it was only based on the political science and focus group so i believe that you can change the opinion the public opinion and that's our role you know we want to change the public opinion uh, and 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 like that you'll have more support and actually what we are doing it's going well from 0% of the vote when we created the party in 2018 2019, 1.6%. <coughs> and sorry, the last uh, the last election in uh, 2021, in September, 5% and will grow. And the next election will grow. So we have the best ideas. We just need to be out there and to speak about it. That's why I want you to become a member of, the, of, of our party, to be part of that debate and, and help us to build the People's Party all across the country. Yeah. And on that similar note, we have a question from Kevin Taylor on YouTube. Uh, he says, new viewer here. First of all, welcome, Kevin. Welcome to the PPC family. Uh, I'm very <coughs> interested to, uh, in joining the PPC. How can I become more involved in the party? Oh, great. 
First, you know, go on our website, People's Party of Canada, see, read our platform, understand pretty well of what we are fighting for. And, and you must know that our party is based on four principles, individual freedom, personal responsibility, fairness, <clears throat> and respect. And all our policies are, in, are, are based on these principles, in line with these principles. So we're doing politics differently. And we believe that we have the best vision for this country. We just have to speak about it openly with passion and conviction, and this party will grow. So be know our platform, read it, and second, become a member. And also you can be a volunteer if you want in your writing. You can write, there's an address at info at people's party of Canada.ca. And it can take maybe three or four days before answering your email because we are a small team in Ottawa. We are building uh, that party step by step. And I hope that you can be a volunteer for the next campaign with your candidate that we will have in your writing. Because I can tell you, every Canadian will have the opportunity to vote for their values because we'll have a candidate in every riding in this country. Excellent. Do we have some more questions? Penny K on YouTube asks, Max, what would you do to stop and reverse the acquisition of our natural resources by Chinese state-owned companies? One <laughs> just bought a lithium mine. Great yes, like I said, go on our website, read our policy on that. We have a policy. We want to be sure that our natural resources that are strategic for our country cannot be by, by the Chinese Communist Party. And yes, we can stop that. There's a legislation in Canada called Investment Canada, and you can stop that kind of investment. We don't need to pass a new legislation. We just need to use the tools that we have in Canada to stop that. And yes, you have a point, we must stop that and we will. So if you want more details, you can go on our platform and you'll see that uh, we want to be sure that our Canadian resources won't be uh, exploited by the communist. You probably don't remember this, but uh, the first time I met you was actually at my university and you came for a speech and I asked you the exact same question and you had the exact same answer. So, <laughs> the more and now, you and now Danielle, you're the executive director of the body. Yeah, yeah. Far, <laughs> we've come a, we've come a long way. Yeah. Uh, do we have a, a couple more questions before we uh, wrap this up? Ah, Mr. Sleaze on YouTube. Max, will PPC now endorse New Blue in Ontario now that Randy Hillier is no longer running? No, the answer is no. I just, I want to tell you, I personally supported Randy Hillier because Randy is a friend. Randy helped us a lot during the last general election. He was uh, doing speeches with me in Ontario, but not only in Ontario, in Alberta also. <clears throat> so, uh, and Randy decided not to create another party. So we're not in, we're not doing politics at the provincial level. You know, our supporters, our people can decide what they want to do and which party they want to support. That will be their individual decision. The People's Party of Canada won't take any position at the provincial level to support a party or another one. Maybe some <clears throat> members of the People's Party of Canada, members of our party will support the, the new blue or another party. That's their choice. They're, they are free to do what they want. So we are not doing politics at the provincial level and we will never do politics at the provincial level. When I said that I was supporting uh, <clears throat> Randy, it's because personally he's a friend, and, uh, <clears throat> but that party was independent but he decided not to create that party. But, you know, what he wanted to do was independent from us, from the PPC. But, you know, in the end, he decided not to launch this party. That was his personal decision. So what I'm telling you, do what you want to do. Vote for the party that will be in line with your values. And, uh, you know, that's it. Yeah, excellent. Before we wrap things up, uh, I'm noticing a lot of people in the chat are just spamming WEF with question marks. Uh, I, I would uh, point you guys uh, to our, our 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 live stream from last week. We did a whole segment describing uh, our positions on the World Economic Forum uh, in our uh, 
and how we're not aligned with them. Uh, Max, do you want to give a, a few words on, on that before we wrap things up? <clears throat> yeah, just on the World Economic Forum, I just want to let you know that the World Economic Forum does not control our country, does not control any countries. So they, what they are doing, they are kind of a think tank and they're a socialist think tank and they want to impose their philosophy. They want to, to promote their philosophy and they're doing that. They're very efficient. And yes, you have some politicians in Ottawa <clears throat> with the liberals and Trudeau <clears throat> that um, are in line with that philosophy. And you have some civil servants also that are. But Canada is a sovereign country. If you elect, if you elect other politicians like us, like me, that <clears throat> who does... <clears throat> Who, who does not believe in the World Economic Forum. And, I, you know, what we are doing at the PPC is the opposite of that. You know, so you'll have a country, your Canada will regain our sovereignty. But yes, Trudeau, with, with his, uh, you know, what he's doing, his policies, he is doing the same kind of policies that the UN and the World Economic Forum are promoting. All across the country, all across the world. So we won't do anything. We won't do anything with them, and we will work for Canadian first and put our country first. And that's why sometimes people are saying, you know, the World Economic Forum is controlling Canada. No, <clears throat> they are very efficient to promote their ideology to Canadians, uh, politicians. But in the end, you decide what kind of politician you want. And that's your decision. So Trudeau is doing that, is imposing that vision that he believes in. If I'm prime minister, I will have policies that are in line with my vision of the country. And you know that vision, if you are following me, if not, you can read our platform. Excellent, excellent. If, if you want more info, go check out our live stream from last week. We have a longer discussion on uh, the World Economic Forum in particular. Um, so I think that's a great place to wrap things up. If we didn't get to your question today, we'll be doing this on a weekly basis. You can tune in next Thursday at 7.30 p.m. We'll be taking <clears throat> lots more questions like we just did. Uh, and we'll be doing this every week. So uh, the, we'll get through as many questions as we can over the, the next few, few weeks and months. Uh, as we close this up, I, I do want to remind people to to follow us on, on whichever social media you're watching on or, or uh, jump over to some of our other social medias and follow us there as well. Most important thing you can do is jump over to our website, sign up for our newsletter to stay apprised on what's going on with the, the PPC and become a member. Become a member. We need to get those membership numbers up and we need to get as many of you involved in the party as we can. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, we'll be back next week for another exciting episode uh, to talk about what's going on in Canada. Do you have any parting words, Maxim? Yeah, I just want to thank you, Danielle. Uh, that was fun. And, uh, you know, that's our second uh, episode. And like you said, we'll do that every week. And we, if you have any comments, how to improve what we're doing or what you want to hear, just write to us, tell us that. And, you know, we, uh, I like what you are doing, but maybe we can, improve it. we can improve something. Let us know. Give us your comments. But thank you, everybody. And be with us next uh, Thursday night. Yeah, yeah, we're just getting started. Stay strong and free, everyone. Yeah.